turn my mic up. Boy, yo. Take there. Yeah, yeah, uh. On the road to the riches. Life takes a toll like bridges. Good friends become foes and snitches. Better watch who knows in your business. business, 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 business. All right, hustle fam, hustle fam. We are back. Um, today, today we have a special guest. Now, just to give a little bit of a backstory, um, you know, I put a post on my Instagram um, a couple months ago, maybe about a month ago, and I wanted to know who was doing it in H Town. I said, "Listen, man, I know Chuck and Hustle got love in H Town. Who, who, who do I need to connect with in the H Town area?" And I got a whole bunch of tags, and it was at. Brandon J. Hustle. And I said, who's this Brandon J. Hustle guy, man? So, you know, I, I found out who he is, and, and that's the brother who we have on the show today, Mr. Brandon Johnson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate the opportunity, man, for sure. Yeah, man. So um, apparently you got, you got some recognition in the town, man. You've been doing your thing. Um, so, you know, thank you for coming on the show today to talk about um, what you've been doing. Um, you are the owner of Next Level Hot Shots, right? And also, yes, um, that, which is a hot shot, hot shot company, right? Yes, and then sir. you also be logistics where you actually dispatch for other hot shot companies, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we do both of those. Uh, you know, started with the regular hot shot company for myself, and then we just kind of evolved and now we do dispatching for other companies to help them be successful as well. All right, cool, man. Yeah. So let, 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 let's talk about this journey, man. Let, let, let's kind of start from the beginning. You know, I like to always give some context and some texture to my guests. Um, talk about coming up, where, where you from? You know, give us a little bit of your backstory. Okay, well, uh, technically, currently right now, yeah, we, like you said, we reside in Houston, Texas. I live in the suburbs, I in Katy. Uh, shout out to all the suburbs, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, yeah, Katy, but uh, just growing up, I mean, I was actually born in Waco, Texas few hours away and uh, I just pretty much lived everywhere. So, you know, my mom at an early age, her and my dad split up. So I lived with her my whole life. So pretty much we went everywhere. She, we were moving about every nine months all over the United States. So by the time I graduated high school, I had been to 14 different schools. And so naturally I was always like a shy kid kind of growing up. So I had to get over that real quick because your environment, you know, changes a lot of things about you. So I got to the place where, hey man, you know, I'm not gonna experience nothing if I just wanna stay introverted. So I have to reach out there and be you know, different outside of myself. So now I've been back in Houston. I got, I graduated from a high school that's over here outside of Katy, Texas. Uh, and then after that, I mean, it's pretty much, that's kind of where the story starts in a sense, because my parents were hyper religious and I was like, man, I need to go do something. I need to get out of here, you know, the rules and stuff, I can handle it. So I moved out of my house six months into high school. So my journey of working, proving value to myself, what can I handle, what can I not? It started for me at a very young age I didn't have any utopian things of other people. So just been grinding pretty much since then. Got you. So you said you moved yeah. out of your house six months out of high school. Yep. I All right. Out. So yeah. when you moved out, what, 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 what was your plan, man? So you, I'm, I'm assuming you're about 17, 18 years old at that time. Um, what does a 17, eight year, 18 year old do when he moves out at, at six months after high school? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, man. So <laughs> it's funny because uh, actually, when I was 15 years old, I was with my brother for a period of time because I was wilding out at my mom's house. So she sent me to stay with my brother, and he just completely just, you know, trying to break my will in order to change what I was doing, punking me on an everyday basis, all that. Because <laughs> he was eight years older than me, so he played Baylor. He went to Baylor, played football. So he was, he was punking me, basically. So, you know, I had to learn a lot of stuff in his house. You know, he had me on trying to get money, you know, hustling, cutting grass. He had me doing all these different things. So... One thing I understood about myself at a young age is that I will put in the work. Okay. That's what that's what I learned through that period of time living with him. So, you know, 18 years old, graduate high school, want to do what I want to do, just being rebellious like everybody else. And I remember uh, it was a Saturday morning and I had got a speeding ticket or something. And then I was my Saturday morning was my court date. And so I was trying to talk to my dad, you know, back then it's map quest, trying to figure out these directions, because I hadn't lived in Houston that long at that point. And so I was trying to figure out how to get there. He was like, figure it out. I'm like, all right. He said, then when you come back from court, we're gonna have a talk. Now, like, okay, whatever. Went to the court, came back, and then when I got back to the house, they wanted to talk to me before I went to go work that day at Sears. So they put a, a big long list of everything I started doing. And at the very end of this conversation, he told me, Man, if you don't like the rules of the house, straight up, you can move out. Mm. And I, when he told me that, I was like, What? You know, like it was Saturday, I was like, I can move out. And at this point, that never dawned on me that if I, I can move out, like I never correlated that to, like I'm 18, I can leave. And so he told me that that Saturday morning, I went to work, 
uh, talking to my friends, I moved out there Tuesday night. I came to a straight trash bag, <laughs> loading up whatever I let me take, a bed, I had to sit on a mattress. Oh I mean, had eighty dollars in my pocket. That was it, eighty dollars. <laughs> like I'm out of here, man. I'm out of here. I don't care what you talk about. I go fail. I don't know. I'm out of here. So I put right. my stuff. Boom. I was out, and then pretty much from then, I just been out here ever since, man. So, 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 so he didn't have to tell you twice. She was like, oh, I can move out. Okay. I, I'm, I'm on it then. No problem. <laughs> Facts. Yeah, tell it. Because I'm like, you know, 17 years old. And I'm working, you know, even going to school, you know, playing football and stuff. Then I had a little side job and my, my regular job part time. Then I used to work him on the weekends at the Houston Chronicle around here. So even at six, you know, 15 to 17, 18 years old, I had two jobs. Three jobs. You know, I wasn't saving no money. I understood if I had to go get some, I wasn't tripping about going to go work. So that was my confidence. Then, like, oh, so I work three jobs. That's fine. Whatever. I'll sleep whenever I get ready. Or if I can't sleep, that's fine. So that birthed that in me at a very young age. So it helps mm. me today, of course, because I never anticipate or estimate how much work something's going to take in order to achieve my goal. And that's mm. what most people lose themselves. They, how long is that going to take? How many hours a day? How long are you going to work? What time am I going to get off? I never correlate that too, because I understand the difference between or the distance between where I'm at today and where I want to go is the amount of work I need to put in. So I mm. never put a you know a certain time frame or estimation on work. All I know is I'm getting to the destination. So I'm mm. down for whatever I need to do to get there. And that's why I think most people lose out on. You know what? I like that, man, because you're right. I think a lot of times when people look at opportunities, they 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 automatically think, well, how long is it gonna take me? You know what exactly. I mean? Like, like, like a lot of times, if you see somebody wanting to get into a different business, they're like, okay, you want a wholesale house as well. How long before I make my first $10,000? How long before I do this? How, and, 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 and that right there, if, if, if somebody tells you, well, I don't know, it, it, it depends on how hard you work. I mean, some people will make it in the first month. Some people will make it in the first 10 years. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no exactly. real answer to that, but people want those definitive timelines that don't exist. And that's probably the first thing about entrepreneurship you got to understand. And there's, there's no guarantee in anything, man. It just takes as long as it takes. You know what I mean? You Correct. have to be willing to commit. Correct. And so that's for me, man. I'm like, any investment I'm willing to do today, conversation, message, you know, if I'm making a Facebook ad, I'm thinking about branding something, I'm never anticipating to getting paid today. So mm. one of the things that my dad told me at a young age, he said, people will always pay you for what you have done, not what you will do. So mm. I got used to that in my other job. Like, okay, I want to raise. I want the job to give me a $5,000 raise. I tell my boss in June, hey, uh, raise time come in March. I need $5,000. And I tell him in June. So now I know, okay, what you want me to do? I got to hit these numbers. Boom. I'm going to smash everything you're telling me to smash. All I want you to do is have a bag for me when <laughs> March time come. That's it. Yeah. So I got used to that then. So then to come out here now and then have to hustle, it's the same. So whatever I got to do now, I'm not looking for monetary benefits today. I'm looking for it eventually. You know what I mean? Mm. So people always are looking for the right now, but there's no value in right now. The value comes in your experience. So my experience lets you know, I know what I'm talking about, not what I supposedly would do in a utopic you know, situation. Right, right, right. You know I like mean? that. I like that. That's yeah. dope. All right, yeah. cool. So, so, so you, you, you get out on your own. Tell me about some of the, 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 the first things you get into as far as you know, making your way. Okay, well, uh, I moved out of my parents' house, of course, you know, left. They told me, hey, you know, why, as long as you, you know, we had a situation where I had a truck that they were paying for me, and they told me straight up, as long as you stay in school, with you can, you know, pay the insurance, you stay, you keep the truck. I'm like, all right, cool, there ain't no problem. So I get out here, not knowing, I thought I was making $8 an hour on my job when I moved out the house, and I was like, yo, I gotta do something else. This ain't cutting you, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was struggling with the whole school thing. I said, forget this, Drop, dropped out of college, whatever. Uh, and then had to work a couple little side jobs. I mean, I was like a waiter. Then I was out here doing little side jobs for my, my homeboy's dad, you know, whatever I do. So when they found out I got out of school, they came and just confiscated my truck. And I was like, yo, what I'm gonna do? They like, you know, if you come pick up this truck, you do something, we'll call the police. And I'm like, what? How am I supposed to get around? They like, figure it out. Right. You, you wanna move out, you figure it out. And I'm like, bet. So my apartment was by like a maybe 300 yards from this warehouse. It was an academy warehouse. And it was about three yards, 300 yards behind this warehouse. So I was putting applications, talking to people, uh, ended up getting a job at the little warehouse. And I remember that across this, this little golf divide that was between my apartment complex and this warehouse, it was a field. And I'm 6'1", and this grass was almost as tall as me across <laughs> okay. this field. But okay. there's no other way I could get there without walking on the street at 5 o'clock in the morning because we have to be there at 6. Mm. So I'm just like, okay, I got to go get it. So I remember, you know, 
walking up this field the first few days and I had to run across this field because I was scared. They got to be snakes, animals, you know, because it's <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning in Texas. It's little dude. I, get, I run across this field. And, I mean, by the time I got to my socks, be soaking wet. And so I started working at this warehouse job. So that was the first time I got out because I had no Hold on one second. And I, I ain't oh, gonna oh, give oh, up. Hold on one second. Hold on. Hold, you fro you froze. Much overtime. Hold, okay. hold on. You, you froze. Um, okay. Is your Wi Fi on? Okay. Yeah, it's on. Is it's on? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you you started you started cutting off when you started talking about the field. So just start start right there. Like talk, start talking about the the, the the six foot one field. You started kind of cutting out at that point, and I'll edit it out. Okay, I got you. Cool. Yeah. So I'm like six foot one. So I'm looking across this divide that's about 300 yards to get to the, you know, the destination of the job. So the grass was so tall, I understood, especially when he, in Texas, it was around the summertime, so the mildew was there. So it's a lot of moisture. So when I would run across this field, by the time I get on the other side of it, you know, my socks would be soaking wet, and I had to work for 10 hour shift, I was on my mind, so even I had a friend come, and he started working at the same place. He told me, hey, man, you know, if you need me to, I'll pick you up. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, no, nah, man, because you pick me up, I'm going to get used to that. So I need to keep running across this field. So I work every day to allow me to work to save enough money to buy my own car. So that was me kind of stepping out, doing something else. But, yeah, that was like kind of a defining moment of those little times when you learn something about yourself uh -huh. that will take you to your destination later. So, gotcha. I mean, I'm, I'm big into, you know, no excuses, no quit, whatever you need to do. No one cares. Ain't nobody going to help you. You need to just put in the work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Got you. So when do we start making our way into the hot shot industry? Okay. Well, that happened because uh, I've been in my job for a while and uh, pretty much uh, I was highly successful in my job already. So I've probably been in that job four or five years and they told me I was making too much money. So they stopped giving me raises. Right. So I'm thinking, well, shoot, I'm still barely, you know, 31, 32 years old. And now they are telling me no matter how much longer I work here, I'm not going to be able to get them more raises, so I need to do something else. So I remember I had been problems with my knee for a couple of years, so I set up to have a knee surgery uh, in, like, January 2015. So one thing is I understood is I know what I did not know, right? So I've been a retail manager for over 10 years at this time, and so I knew I knew how to run their business, but I understand business. You know, business one-on-one, -on -one, I had no clue, you know? Right. So what I did is I knew I was had a knee surgery about five months before, so I bought probably 15 books, business, you know, real estate for dummies. I bought everything, rich dad, poor dad, richest man in Babylon, think and grow rich. I'm mean, about all these books and I don't like reading nothing. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> if, uh, if I'm serious about my future, when I'm laid up in the bed, cause I have to be laid off work for three months, three and a half months. If I'm serious about my future, I read these books every day. And mm. I probably ain't read a book besides, you know, the Bible in like years, you know what I mean? So, you know, at the, at the high school age, hey, I, I what I'm reading for, you know, so right. I hadn't done any of that. So, you know, get to that. Hold, hold on again. Hold on again. You, you cut, you're cutting off. Oh, every morning, oh, I wake up. I hold on. I go to work. Hold on. Okay. Cut, cutting out again. Try, try to take the Wi-Fi off and let's see if that works better. Because okay. sometimes when you have that okay. Wi-Fi on, okay, it blocks. Sure. Yeah, try, try with it off. Okay. I don't see you now. You should be able to restart the video again. Oh, do you see me now? No, I don't see you. I just see your name right now on the screen. Um, okay. Hit, hit. There you go. Now you're back. You got it? Okay. Got to get off there. Okay. Let's, let's try it there okay. because for some reason it was, it was cutting out. It might, it might work better here. How's your bars, your okay. signal on the phone? Does your, your signal look good with the, with the regular 4G? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. All right, let's, 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 let's rock out there. Let's rock out okay. with there. All right, so we're talking about um, you getting into the hot shots. Um, okay. Where where were we last last off? Uh, uh, I was talking about I had knee surgery and stuff. Okay, the knee surgery, reading the books. Yeah. Start start from there again. Sorry about okay, that, cool. but I, I wanted yeah. to, to flow. So, all right, knee yeah, surgery, yeah, books, let's, let's get it. Okay, cool. So, 2015, uh, I scheduled a knee surgery. So, a part of that knee surgery, um, I pretty much bought like 15 books. So, you know, all the business books. Think and Grow Rich, Real Estate for Dummies, uh, different business books, Traction, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all that, Richest Man of Babylon, all those top entrepreneur books. Uh, and so I made a promise to myself when my wife would go to work every day, 
from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. All I do is read, study, and take notes. And I was like, I'm gonna take this time to invest in myself in education because I never read a business book, probably except the Bible, and never. So, but I did understand what I did not know, you know. So <clears throat> that's what I decided to do. And that's what really began to change my perspective on things is to like now my mind now needs to be molded to really understand what's going on opposed to just going with situation. You know what I mean? Because I always thought of myself as sticking outside the box, but yet when it came to making money or working for somebody, I was a sheep because, mm. you know, I allowed somebody else to dictate my value per hour. So instead of, you know, I'd always boast and even though I had an easy job or I make $70,000 a year doing pretty much nothing, you know, instead of saying, oh, yeah, I sell an hour of my life for $28 an hour or whatever, I sell an hour of my life today. Instead of, you know, the value that, hey, if I can perfect something, I can get paid $200 an hour. Like that never dawned on me until I started reading those books. Mm. Then I'd be understanding assets. And I said, well, I've always worked hard in my life, but I ain't never touched six figures. So how am I touch fig six figures within myself? And I didn't understand that. So I started reading like Rich Dad Poor Dad and understanding about assets and Richest Man in Babylon and having babies and slaves and all that stuff that's talked about in that book. And I was okay, so I need to exponentially, you know, mimic myself or duplicate myself through other avenues in order to get to that financial destination. Okay. Or at least get close to it. So okay. that's what really made me think about, you know, trucking, you know, because I thought to myself, well, shoot, you still see trains everywhere. So obviously transportation ain't gonna go nowhere. Right. You know, and I didn't know anything about transportation, but I can understand just look around and you know, it's common sense of transportation because no matter what technology, it's still trains out here. Okay. So that's what really made me look into transportation and, you know, going into that avenue, you know, reaching out to people, you know, looking, I want to see people check stuff. I don't care what you're talking about. I want to see these numbers because, right. you know, I understand that there's risk involved, you know, with putting up a lot of money. So right. That's what kind of got me in the transportation in general. And so I ended up picking hot shots opposed to big trucks. Okay. That's kind of kind of started my narrative. Okay. So what, what, yeah. what'd you do after you decided, look, you, you, you reached out to some people, um, got some information, obviously, on, on, on the business model, the hot shot model. What was your next, what, what was your first step to get into the business? Uh, well, actually, I had a conversation with my dad because he was running for one of these local companies over here where they run like boxes and all that. And he had already been in transportation uh, for a while already. And so orig originally, I was going to invest with a friend of mine. And basically, he was going to give me just a plug with somebody that had the logistics. And I was going to get a big rig, put a driver in it, buy the equipment, and then just sit back and get bread. You know, but then when I start looking at, you know, what's the scalability of that? You know, because, okay, my money be working for me, but it's not, I'm not in control of it. You know, and so I didn't want to leave my job and go kind of work for another system of somebody else anyway. So I was kind of leery. So then when I started finding out about hot shots, had a conversation with him. We agreed on some stuff and we talked about that, I think that late October. And so then I ended up doing the paperwork over Christmas time. And then that authority piece of paper came in like in February. But then we got started in that August. So technically the business, you know, manifested in August of 2016 where we ran our very first load under the company of Next Level Hot Shot, uh, and that's how I got started. So it's kind of weird how we got started, you know, real, real quick. It's kind of, he was working for somebody else now doing Hot Shot, and then I kept pushing, man, let's start, let's start, let's start, come on, you playing. And he was kind of dragging his feet because he was comfortable, and then all of a sudden the company he was working for, dude lost his insurance, so they were already having issues. He lost his insurance, so then no one could operate. So as soon as we got the business up and flowing, we started out with four units. Okay. So we went from four to two, and then we back up to four. But that's kind of how we got it started. Okay, got you. So, yeah. I mean, talk about the, the beginning, get, getting started in business, man. Like, how, how, how was it? Tell me, you know, what, what, did, did, did everything kind of flow? Did it come together? Um, talk to me about some failures. T tell me a little bit about getting started in business four years ago in the hotshot industry. Man, it was absolutely, everything bad that could happen, happened. Everything, right? And, you know, you ain't ready for that mentally. You think that you are? But you ain't ready for that mentally, man. So, right. like I said, we start the business, and one of the guys, the guy who was in charge of the other business that failed, and he came to, you know, merge it with us, you know, pretty much he was going to handle all the dispatching. So he was handling dispatching. I was the numbers guy, bank, you know, payroll, all that because of my experience. And then my pops, he's going to do all the safety. That's what we decided to do. That okay. was our roles, and it was defined. So, of course, once again, at this point, I still hadn't done anything to really know anything about trucks. I didn't understand the market pay rate. I was just trusting that this dude been out here 15 years. So he got us. 
That's okay. what I figured. You know, my dad, talk, we talk about him. He coming over here and sing, woo, 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 sounding good to me because yeah. I don't know anything, you know. I'm thinking, oh, he's going to kill everybody. <laughs> you know, we went from zero to four. Oh, man, this is this is a breeze, you know, right. like, oh, boy. You know, right, right, right. This is going to be a breeze. Ha, 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 Davis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, shout out to him. Uh, he's going to be a breeze. Man, got that thing going and come to find out that a couple of months, you know, I, I remember one of the loads that my driver got personally, this dude picked up a load, went from Oklahoma to California for $1,300. You mm. know what I mean? And mm. they got two cars to come back. So we lost. I lost like $700, you know, doing that run. But I'm like, something ain't seeming right. Something ain't right. I don't know what ain't right. I should be making money. You know, right, just, I'm right. asking people, asking people. And to me, they couldn't identify exactly what my issue is because everyone else hadn't done it from, you know, organically. They just got in with somebody, you know, somebody else planning a little logistics. So nobody can answer my question. So we had a few months of that and everything was going bad. I mean, I was cycling my savings account. Things looking bad. This ain't going right. So I thought to myself, you know what? If this is going to fail, it needs to fail with me being in position so I can't blame nobody. Mm. I'm going to say this is my L and through an L, I'm going to get a lesson. So that's what I, that's what I figured because I was touting, you know, my past when, hey, man, something needs to be defend, I'll put it to work. So make a long story short, I uh, basically talked to my assistant at that time. She worked for me, one of my managers, and I told her what we're going to do. We're doing a little paperwork together. And so we basically quit on the same day of my job. Mm. So she quit, I quit. And I said, hey, I'll tell you what, if we come out here and it fails, I'll go get a job if you stay in the office. And so I'll go out here and hustle and then come do the paperwork at night. If we come out here together, and that's what I do. So your job is secure. But mine, you know, I, I do whatever it takes to keep you in position. So we agreed. We came out here. And then we started doing dispatching. That's how I was going to do the administration. Start getting into what dispatching looked like. And I found out that the dispatcher was the problem. Mm. So we had the right equipment. Everything was good. Then I started getting on low boards, researching low boards, going back to all the paperwork over the last six months, looking at, okay, he booked this load for this much. Going, by, going, going back and looking at, okay, so from Oklahoma to here, and I'm looking at the paperwork, and that load was going 90 cents a mile. I'm mm. like, huh? So then I'm looking at low boards, and I'm seeing people, I'm asking questions to low boards. they like, oh, man, the rate, you know, the market rate is 130. I go back and look at paperwork. He getting loads that's paying 150 a mile or something. Then my guy's getting 110 a mile. So I'm calling my pops, like, yo, this dude trash. We need to get rid of him. He like, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. I said, no, I, I know numbers. And I'm telling you, this don't equate to nothing, right? This dude right. trash. So I told him, I'm going to start dispatching. He like, no, nah, you need to play your role. I don't care what you're talking about. I'm going to do dispatching. He's dispatching <laughs> himself and you. I'm going to dispatch my people, and we're going to see what's happening. Right. So we did that, bro, for like, you know, about, after about one month, we went from operating as an average as a company to 130 a mile to $2 a mile, and then I was getting money. And I was mm. like, see, I told you that dude was the problem. Mm. But then me and him were flexing with each other going back and forth. And so, you know, after that, after I established that, then me and my assistant, Erica, we pretty much took over all dispatching. And then we started rising up to where we trying to go in our destination. That's how that ended up happening. What do you think was the main ingredient um, that helped you kind of optimize your operation as far as like coming from those, you know, days of whatever the, the, the other dispatcher was getting you to being to get over that $2 a mile? Like what, what did you implement into your strategies um, for dispatching that got you to where you got to those numbers you were looking for? Okay. Well, basically what I was doing was that, you know, like we talked about earlier about putting in the work. So like the first couple of days I was out here, all I was doing is just straight up on a computer, like on truck stop. I would just really type in a city. I took a map from the United States and I would just pull out all like the regular cities, big cities in the map and figure out where do we need to go? Right. So I would just sit there and do that for two days, take notes, you know, if I type in fifteen thousand dollars the most weight capacity, you know, for a truck in Houston, Texas, and I'll sit there and just look on the load board to see, watch those real time loads, and I'll see one paying good. I try to call it and figure out what do you need for me to get this load instead of these other ones that's paying, you know, forty cents. And so it's kind of started that way to understand it's all about negotiation and positioning and being first to the mark. So mm. then I said, oh, so it's all about competing with one another. So we basically got strategies. Okay. We're not trying to move for less than, say, 175 a mile up to 250. So we'll let a person sit there in order to wait for this thing to happen 
And then from that, then that's what started helping us getting that truck load, truck load, truck load. And then I'll start figuring out, well, shoot, if I get this truck load and I got a couple of little bit of time, you know, negotiating with the broker, trying to get a little more time, instead of dropping off eight o'clock morning, let me drop it off at three. So then I'll throw that parcel on the back and now we're moving for 260 a mile, 240 a mile. And so then we start to understand, okay, so now I see the problem is that, you know, it's all about, you know, maximizing the opportunity and trying to get as many loads on that trailer as I can with establishing a time frame with the broker. Mm. So they're not expecting me to pick up at 3 p.m. and deliver at 8. Because when a lot of that happened, I'll tell them, no, I want to pick up at 3. My guys need to do some stuff, make up something they need to do, and let me get 12 hours to drop their load off at 3. So then we pick up the load, get a little partial, drop their partial off first, and then come back to their load before 3 o'clock came. Then the numbers started doubling on us being able to be successful. Mm. Got yeah. you. What, what do you... Wh- have you ever um, thought about expanding into like general freight, like tra- uh, trailers, dry vans, reefers, such, such like stuff like that? Like, or, or, or do you feel like your niche is in hot shots? And why do you like hot shots so much? Okay. Uh, well, hot shots is pretty much the only thing I've done at this point. I am definitely, and it's probably because brothers like you, you know, DeMarco, you know, Alex Goodins, I'm looking at these dudes like, they are killing with these big trucks. You know what I mean? So I'm looking at that. <laughs> And I'm le- and I mean, I, I know the numbers because I look at all the numbers and stuff. And to me, it was never just enticing because I like to struggle. Like, I like to be like, oh, we'll keep you moving for $5,000 a week on a hot shot. And they're like, you a lot. Then I kill them with 6000 a week. Ah! You know what I mean? So I always like that, that, the hardship of it more, I think, better. But I can definitely see the need in order to expand in that in my dispatcher company just because of the fact that I've been able to, uh, you know, I say provide solutions to problems. And I think when it comes to scalability, you know, definitely big truck. I mean, you got a load, you got unlimited potential in the big truck in order to scale. So right. actually I'm looking at that as a, it actually the month of April, I'm probably gonna dispatch a, a big truck for free. Uh, actually, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm glad we're doing this too, but probably in the month of April, I'm gonna get a big truck. I'm gonna dispatch it for 30, 60 days for free to prove myself first. Mm-hmm. And then once you get comfortable and understand that, and I get my girls on it, my team, to understand how we do it, then I'll start offering, you know, big trucks, whatever you got, as well as hot shots. Okay, so we'll cool. We'll start offering everything. I like that. All right, so let's yeah. kind of get into talking about the dispatch company. So you grew your company to four, um, four trucks. Yeah, What's that's it? what we got right now. We four, got four trucks. trucks right how many? How many trailers? Uh, right now we got five. Okay, so four yeah. trucks, five trailers, and then you started seeing that there was um, um, some room in the market to help out other hotshot companies. So talk about that transition from, you know, dispatching your own trucks to actually starting your, um, your dispatch business, which is B Logistics. Talk to me about that transition, the train, the, the, the thought process, how you got into that space. Okay. Well, actually it was kind of like the thing. So my dad, of course, saw the transition between, you know, us coming out here in just a few months and changing the flow of the business opposed to what he'd always seen before. And so I'd always ask him questions like, so before our business model was, pick up a freight, go to a place, get two cars, come right back to the house. And I'm looking like, well, that's done. Once you just pick up freight over there in Florida, if they got, they just keep going. Who told you to come on? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> right. you know, that's why I seen it. So I, I was just focusing on us, understanding everything, doing all that. Cause I also have a landscaping business too. So I was halfway doing that too. And so uh, that's what we we're doing. And so he actually recommended a brother to come to us that he met and do was complaining about his dispatching. He couldn't get loads over, you know, making $2,000 a week or something. And so my dad told him about us. So he called me. We talked about it. You know, did all the paperwork he was running. And so he was just telling everybody, man, my dispatch is killer. Oh, man. So he was sending us people, sending us leads. And so I thought to myself, okay, you know, maybe we should do something because even though I have to be in his office from, you know, me, 730 to 5, because, you know, stuff can happen. The driver gets to the destination. The load ain't ready. Broker talking about something crazy. You know, you got to get back on the phone. So I knew I had to be in the office for these 10 hours. So I was like, well, sometimes we got downtime. You know what I mean? We sit around for a day with, any, with nothing to do. So what else can we do? So then I decided to use that extra time for us to now start helping other companies. So mm. we started out with one, did that for a few months. I, I like this extra amount of money because like anybody that knows they have a company, you know, money coming in, money going out, money coming in. And I'm like, man, this is a seesaw that I hate. You know, because right. I mean? with a job, money coming in. You know, used to, you know, oh, man, we got 5000 a week and then you get a phone call, cost you 3000 Right. Well, that sucks, you know what I mean? So we're doing dispatching, same skill, same amount of time that's reserved. But yeah, now money's coming in. So I'm like, okay, it's starting to flow. It's starting to, you know, help out on some of my failures, 
some of my things I need to learn from experience with being in the marketplace. So this flow of money coming in, I really like it. Even though it's a lot less, I still like it because we got to be in there anyway. So let's maximize the opportunity. So gotcha. now, you know, that's how we kind of got started. So we did that for the first six to nine months with just one guy and then made it a business, made it a DBA, and then we start offering it. So even before now, I do all my advertising through Facebook advertising because I'm trying to reach out to people that's not necessarily in my market. So I'm trying to reach out to those in the Midwest. I, I got clients in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma. We got people all over the United States. And so we just foster this relationship through the phone. Got you. What yeah. do people need to know before they get into the hot shot business? What do they need to know? You need to know your numbers, right? You need to know everything. I tell people a lot of times, you know, education over entertainment, right? So it's one thing for somebody to say, you know, I'm gonna take this leap of faith, right? But then what you're so-called saying is that I'm gonna try to, you know, do more work to override my ignorance. That's what you're saying, right? I think I can work harder than my level of ignorance. And that's what shoots people in the foot. You cannot do that. So even though you're betting on yourself, which means you gotta have the mentality that every day when I wake up, I eat what I kill. If I don't kill nothing, I don't eat. So that's a separate mentality from, I still need to know my numbers. So then when I am eating, I'm eating top notch. I'm eating lion, I'm eating bear. I'm not eating possum or squirrel, you know what I mean? So when you don't know your numbers, you eating, you know, possums, you eating the, you know, the food that's bad. You ain't gonna ever get to the prime steaks because you just out here selling for anything. So right. I look at that as being an issue with people out here without understanding what are you getting yourself into. So if I had to do it all over again, I would invest it with a you know a mentor. I would invest it with some consulting for six months. I would invest it in something <laughs> on a consistent basis to make sure I understood this plan definitively and use somebody else's bad experiences and then you know make sure I didn't repeat the same behavior. So mm. you gotta know your numbers. So yes, bet on yourself, but know what you're betting on. You know what I mean? So that's what I would recommend or say to them. No doubt. I like that. So besides knowing for your, knowing your numbers, what else? What can you look forward if, if you're going to be a own, you're, you're going to be operating your hot shot, let's say, um, okay. what, what are some of the things that you should expect um, out of this type of business? Okay. Uh, nobody to help you. Uh, it's going to be terrible to get started in the first 90 days because nobody trusts you. Uh, and so, you know, understanding those two dynamics, you need to position yourself in a certain way. So that's, you know, you want to come out here and do it by yourself maybe lease on with somebody for a while to understand the ins and outs. You can go ahead and start your authority if you want to on the side, at least have some age on it or something. So that way then when you do jump out here for yourself hundred percent, at least you would already, you wouldn't be starting from day one. You know what I mean? So I look into, you know, trying to get people more of that understanding. Cause one thing we do with our dispatching is that since I, I have a company, when I post trucks all over the United States, the broker's calling me looking for next level trucks, but then I slide and be logistics truck. Mm. So if somebody's a new person, they've been out here four months. Well, they're not going to be calling you trying to give you no know, two dollars a mile, but they'll call me thinking it's my truck. I say, Oh, no, I'm sorry, we dispatch is this is this dude's MC, but I already got you on the phone, right? So our ability to negotiate on your behalf will still let you be successful. Why, why are yeah. a lot of dispatchers um, so tentative to get into dispatching in the hot shot, um, hot shot industry? You said, Why, why are they? Why, why are a lot of dispatchers tentative to, to kind of dive and try to get into dispatching hot shots? Uh, I think because it's the, the amount of work, right? So like if I were to pull up Houston, Texas and type in a big truck, you know, 48,000 pounds or something, you're going to find like 40 pages of load. <laughs> so that's just, you know, and everything is the only difference, maybe 20 cents between each one. So of course that's easy. I do the exact same thing in hot shots. You know, I'm going to get two pages, mm. right? So there, you know, the difference in, you know, the, the, the level of work is what people do not want to do. And that's what I'm saying. So me, I like to stand in the niche, so I'm able to leverage all the relationships that we built over the last four years. Since day one, we've always had administration. So brokers are not calling looking for my trucks. They're calling looking for my assistant. They're mm. calling me. So we're in position. I know where you are. I've talked to you at 7 o'clock this morning. So by the time this broker's calling 8 o'clock, we already know everything, so they shouldn't call you for nothing. We know where you are, your expectation of time, and we're already working on loads that's going to be ahead of you. So it's the understanding that you got to stay ahead of the game. You got a preliminary beforehand. You have to get in early before the market starts and leave when the market is over. You know, so when people really don't have that estimation of the work that's involved, they don't want to do it because they can still charge the same eight, seven, ten percent and do a lot less work. Right. So I understand it from their arena, 
But in order for me to build both of my businesses, I need to make as many connections as humanly possible. Right. So me handling both sides of that still allows me to get to places, have buying power, you know, go to my factory company, say, give me a lesser percentage because we come in with 15 trucks. Oh, man, what about this back office over here? Insurance. So I'm able to leverage different relationships based on coming to the table with having a lot of different people. Mm, so you say relationships yeah. is definitely the key because like you said, the load board, the load board isn't just flooded with the plethora of loads every day um, for hot shots. Absolutely not. So if you're not here having phenomenal service, that's what we call, you know, my company Next Level Hot Shot. So my whole thing when I'm marketing, I'm talking to people is that when you need next level service, then you call me because I'm not out here doing what they do. You know what I mean? The, the whole owner, person in the truck, I mean, no, no shade against them, but you know, they're a one man operation. They're doing everything in their truck. So they're going to be missing. They're going to be busy. They're going to be booking a load. They're going to be strapping down a load. So they're going to be missing. We ain't never missing. <laughs> I got multiple people that can answer your phone call, email, send you what you want. I mean, our process is on point. So from administration to us being in the field, everybody got hats, sunglasses, T-shirts. So when we pull up, we're next level across the board. We will yeah. do anything you want us to do as long as you want to pay for it. You know what I mean? Gotcha. We got customers that want you to basically, you know, uh, shrink wrap they, they products. They want us to shrink wrap the metal. I'll do whatever you want us to do as long as you're going to pay. That's it. I don't care how crazy it sounds. You want us to drive around your building three times. That's fine. <laughs> whatever you want to do, you want to pay for it, we're going to give you that next level service. That's just what it is, man. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about um, back, back, going back to your dispatch company. Um, talk to me a little bit about your team and um, the culture that you've built within um, B Logistics. Okay. Well, so right now, it's, of course, my same assistant that we came out here. So she's going to be four years. Then I got another dispatcher. She's been here for a year. Uh, currently, I got an intern dude that's working for me every day, Monday through Friday, 8 to 12, because he just loved with the idea of entrepreneurship. He looks up to me kind of like a big brother. So he's here. And then I'm actually starting to train another lady starting this Monday. So okay. basically, the culture is, you know, we need to partner with our clients. That's our slogan. So when I'm advertising, when I'm having conversations with a lot of uh, companies, a lot of times I'm kind of vetting them. And if anything, uh, I always fire in up firing some clients because of the fact of their lack of communication, right? Mm. So all we have in this life that, that we're losing is time. That's it. I can get more money, another client. I can get that, but we can't give up our time. So with that, we foster an, an atmosphere to where, you know, we're partnering with these clients. They're doing the work. We're making decisions. We're the CEOs of their companies as well. So we need to do what is in their best interest. So every quarter, I have financial meetings with my clients. If they have any questions, I give them free consulting. If they don't got bill of ladies, we make it from them. Do you need logo design? You need, you know, change of address forms. Whatever you need, whatever I want to do for next level, I'm doing the same thing for B Logistics because I understand that your assess is predicated on our ability to execute on dispatching. And that's what I was wanting my company. So that has a certain special place in my heart that we need to execute for them as if it's my company. So for us, there's no difference between next level and B Logistics. If you're on the side of the road, we get your mobile mechanic. If you up all night, call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll stay on the phone with you. Whatever I'm going to do for my left hand, I'm going to do it for my right. Mm. So that's the atmosphere that we have. And so my people cannot be clock watchers. You're going to put in 55, 60 hours a week. If you ain't trying to do that, don't work for me. Mm. Work for somebody else because we need to be here for the client regardless. So that's gotcha. kind of the atmosphere that you know, we're creating is that they're, they're giving us the opportunity to partner with them. We don't work for you. You don't work for us. We're partnering together. So if two parties can't agree, we need to not do business together. Got so you, got you. I like yeah. that, man. And and in kind of looking through your social media, I see that you guys kind of add like elements of fun to your job. Like you guys enjoy what you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. you have little competition. You know, I saw the thing like 100 loads, 200 loads. Like where where yeah. does that where does that come into play? Who who started all that and why is that important? Uh, well, I kind of started that. It's coming from a retail background because I used to always have incentives. You know, when you have a job, okay, there's fibs, incentives. You know, how can you beat so-and-so? You know, whatever, right? So I'm competitive by nature. Let's just say me and you both at a dispatching company. I'm going to call you in the morning and say, hey, good morning. How you doing? Let you know I'm going to smash you today. So call me <laughs> at 530, and I'm going to let you know if I won or not. You beat me, I'm pissed. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I can't sleep if you beat me, right? So right. we had that competitive nature, and so I always – in, re in retail, I always call it, it's like cookie and a stick, right? So I'll tell you what the job is. You say cookie, cookie, cookie and a stick? 
Yeah, that's always my little methodology, right? Okay. So, uh, when we have different things going on in the store, I outline what your job is. Because I've always been managing people, right? I outline what your job is. You confirm with the affirmation of a nod or yes or whatever. Now, since we've outlined the guidelines, now you need to do it, right? So now, mm -hmm. when you are successful, you do it, I reward you. Well, that's, man, we, we buy dinner for my people every week, you know, bonuses, rewarding them with something, you know, whatever, give them a half day or something, you know, they do. So there's reward. If you don't do it, then I'm coming with that stick, that mm. rod of correction. You know what I mean? So because we've outlined what we now need to do. So now us working has nothing to do with anything else. But then when we do work, we need to take time to celebrate the victories because that's what's going to trick our mind to understand that we are the best, not that we're trying to be the best, that we are. So that keeps us in a position to always evolve. What we did in 2019 isn't working in 2020. Mm. And whatever we do this year, that ain't going to be good for 2021. So a part of that incentive is we got to continue to grow. We got to continue to work on our craft. I send them, you know, weekly different things I find on YouTube. When I find little things about what the market is doing, I send it to them on a Saturday. They know Monday morning, first thing in my mouth, what happened with their article? What did they talk about? Because we get paid based on our skill and our craft. Mm. So we need to be the best at what we're doing. And so then when we are, then there's rewards there. If mm. not, I'm going to break it back. You know what I mean? So that's where I've got to see it. No doubt, yeah. man. I, I, I love that. What, what, type of, what type of person makes a good um, dispatcher? What kind of person? Well, first of all, you got to already understand that your craft is what makes you who you are, right? So being obsessed, being a perfectionist, you know, uh, being able to be self-motivated, you know, all that stuff is going to be a, a huge criteria in now allowing your mind to be ready to do this thing because there are so many L's that we catch every day with being a hot shot company. So, for instance, let's say I got a guy sitting in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma or something, right? Well, this dude might sit here for four hours, and we literally might call him 45 loads to trying to get him moving to negotiate for rates. And so we finally get that one load. We about to start flexing, doing push up. We so excited because we had to call him 45 to get that one. So in our dealings with people, negotiations, making sure the paperwork is right, all that, we, we encounter so many L's because we have to do so much work in order to get one load, right? So you have to be able, that individual person has to take pride in their craft because it doesn't matter that we're trying. What matters is when we execute. So you can try all day and not execute and we still got a problem. Mm. You know what I mean? And got that's you. because we still need to keep perfecting our craft. That's what it is, the craft the skill, the craft. So I preach that every single day is that that's what you got to boast in. You got to be excited. Hey man, at the end of the week, how much money did you put up? Oh, and we order high five and clap and ah, ah, ah. You know what I mean? So we, we, we charge each other up. Yeah. Money come, we at zero again. You yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. We at a hundred. Money, mm. zero. And it's over and over and over again. So the person has to be self-motivated and understand that dynamic. We must execute today. Mm. What happened yesterday don't matter. Today. We got yeah. to execute. You know what I mean? So I, I, I like do it. I like that. Talk to me about negotiation, man. You just now talked about that skill, perfecting that craft. When, okay. when, when you're negotiating, what are you thinking about? Just give us a little bit of insight into your mind as a negotiator and a dispatcher to get the best rates. Okay. Well, first of all, we only get paid on what we do, right? So if I got you at anywhere from 8 to 15%, regardless, uh, every if I get one more penny on that loan, that's more money for us. Right. So I want to move my clients to five dollars a mile if I can, because not only am we going to get paid, but I'm going to call my client and say, who's your dad? Right. And they know that they know that phone call. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, man, I, you know, it's your wife. Then it's me. Right. I'm one of your top favorite people in your life. Right. You know? so right. We're right. trying to get that. So, you know, we get these people on the phone is really understanding where we are. So if I'm in, you know, uh, North Dakota or something, well, even though the, the, the rates are trash, I have a truck that's 50 miles away that can come get it. So please understand, we right there, we can come get it. I can't just take 80 cents a mile. I can't. So I tell my client, you might be sitting there, man, but when we move you, we're going to try to get you moving to something good. So I try to stress the fact to the broker that, hey, man, this man is this. This is his equipment. This is where he lives. This is how much he made all week. He really needs to make this amount of number. So we're kind of pretty much presenting a case when we call instead of just going by whatever they say they want to do. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's why I say we catch a lot of L's because a lot of people are like, shut up, take the rate and hang up the phone. So if we don't understand that we need to do something right for our clients, well, it'd be easy just to give me anything and say, shut up, at least you move it and just pass them a load and keep it moving. 
Right. So that's why we catch a lot of L. So, you know, our thing is that we have to stay ahead of our clients. So we book a load Monday. You're going to drop Wednesday morning. Monday evening, we already looking for your next load on Wednesday so we can go through the 45 no's. So by the time you get there, we got that yes, you drop, boom. Next one, you keep it rolling. And so I know like in big trucks, you know, especially like we talk about that dispatcher part, you know, big trucks, since there's so much freight everywhere, a dispatcher will let you get there, drop the load, and they say, call me when you empty. So then when you empty, then they start working on your next load. As soon as you send me pictures that you got a load and you got a strap down, we already looking for your next load already mm. because it's a lot more work. So that's what, for our company, the reason why I call it B Logistics and not dispatching is because we're executing the plan, the people, the, you know, communicate. We're doing all that stuff. So all you have to do is be there at eight o'clock in the morning. Like you told me you were, that's all you got to do. Anything else you need to fight for your money, call us. You know, the, uh, your brokering, I mean, your factory company, the broker trying to be funny. We get detention. All you need to do is call me, answer the phone, and drop the load. That's it. We do mm. everything else. I love everything it, man. Else. Is there yeah. any particular criteria that you're looking for um, when you're looking to partner with a, with, a, with a company? Or is there anything that would disqualify somebody um, that, that you wouldn't work with? Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, uh, I'll reach out to maybe, if they tell me the name of a former dispatcher, I'll call. Uh, usually before I bring a client on, I always pick up the phone with them because my girls can, you know, she can, they can close a deal, but I always have a little hour presentation or we talk about what we do, how we do it, blah, blah, blah. And so if I catch wind that, you know, they don't respect the craft of being a dispatcher, I don't mess with it because I have a huge respect that you go out here, fight the elements, put yourself in uh, harm's way. You know, they basically superheroes in our case. So I respect what you do. So I need you to respect what we doing too as being professional. So mm. when I detect that, you know, you think that, you know, we're beneath you or we work for you, then I don't mess with you. Because I'm looking like you're going to be talking to my girls crazy. You're going to be too aggressive. And I'm not going to have any of that because just like we respect you, we respect the same. So people that's, you know, talking on the clothes, being super aggressive or something like that, I don't mess with that. Because if you got problems, you talk to me. Don't be popping off and doing like crazy stuff. So when a person kind of has that personality, I don't really like them too much because for me to keep you running, Sometimes I got to leverage my relationship and my own personal company to keep you moving so I can't let your mouth ruin what I'm trying to get done because you can't control yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? So I don't mess with clients like that or we're talking. I say, no, I don't think this is a good fit for us as well as you. Because I like at the very beginning, we're partnering together. What question do you have for me? How do we do it? Our philosophies, our missions. We have all that stuff that we need to communicate to make sure we're on the exact same page. Because gotcha. my job is to make you be successful. That's my job. You 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 secure. You're safe. I gotta keep you successful. So if I say, hey, this week the market is doing this. For the next couple months, we need to be in this area to execute. You say no. Okay, that's fine. You know, we can talk about it. We come over the plan, and that's the plan that we're doing at the beginning of the week to make you be successful. Got you. How do you juggle yeah. the two with having your own trucks and then dispatching other people? Like, is there ever a conflict of interest? Is there ever anything that gets in the way? Like, like how does that how does that work for you? Okay. Yeah, because a lot of times that's why sometimes when people in my same marketplace as me, uh, then that comes up in conversations. Because they'll be like, okay, so wait a minute. So if I'm in Houston and you in Houston, so that means you're going to dispatch your trucks first for mine, right? I say, absolutely. But my phone is ringing nonstop because I only have four units and most of my guys are dogs, so they stay gone. So mm. we run our customers, we run 48, whatever we need to do, we do it. So usually, like, it's very seldom. I even have two guys that's in Houston at the exact same time because my guys are out here getting it. So a lot of people that's in Houston, they don't want to leave Texas because they say, well, Texas is so big. And I say, that's true. But you, said company, don't have any customers yet. So <laughs> you need to go build a name and make as much money as humanly possible for your first six months. Then you can come and sit and strategize and we can talk and, you know, try to go get you some customers as well as having dispatching. But when you don't have any customers, you cannot be super picky and putting stipulations on stuff when the market doesn't care that you exist. And that's the part that people understand. I understand you have a business. I understand that you have all these dreams. and I understand all that. But the market does not care. So when that broker's looking to give somebody a loan, they don't care about you or your family. They do whatever they do to get paid. So I try to give them this reality fact that say it's about the work and the execution that you put in that allow you to be successful. It's mm. just not just because you built it, they'll come. That's a lot. If that was true, every time somebody came to business, they would flourish because they built it. But no one comes. That's why the failure rate is so high. And people come with preconceived notions because they talked to a homeboy that was lying 
So that ain't they supposed to make $9 an hour because he say he do, but you ain't looking no checks to us. So then when you get that low of $2 a mile, you mad. I didn't mm. give you a false expectation of this marketplace. That's what you did with talking to other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? What, so, what, yeah. what, what are some of those things that you hear, like some of the fa uh, false expectations that people think when they come into the hot shot business um, that, they, that they quickly learn is not the truth? Okay. They think that they're going to make $5,000 a week with driving 300 miles a week. That's mm. what they think. <laughs> so okay. they'll, yeah, because you explain to them, you get paid per mile that you drive. And they don't understand it. They'll tell me, hey, I want to go, you know, basically from Houston to, you know, Dallas, which is like 250 miles. And yet in a week, I want to make $4,000. And it's like, wait, wait, let's talk about this. So 250 miles, then you come in back, it's this many days. And so then when you start talking to them, you know that they have this figure in their mind and they ain't even done the simplicity of the math. So I run into that time in and time out all the time that they don't understand. Number one, you get paid for the miles you drive. That's number one. Number two, the broker at this point of your business is the customer. So they tell you to do two jumping jacks and then strap the load. That's what you got to do, bro. I know you don't like it. I know that makes you feel some type of way. But why did you come out here, right? You came out here to get this bag. Do whatever you need to do to get this bag. And then when you have established your business, then you have some wiggle room. So these people have put in no work and they expect in the world. That's what I find with people over and over again. And they don't make it six months. They start this business, put up $20,000, and they're gone in 90 days. Mm. It's a sad reality because when I'm speaking to them from experience of what this is going to look like, how I've scaled this business. We've been out here four years, and I haven't driven a load yet. I don't drive at all, never, not one time, right? So I know how to do everything. I do all the trainings. I'm there with the people. If they're on the side of the road, I'm there. I, you know, I have two personal trucks that's under me, so I got all the expenses. I know the percentages. I know everything that you can think of with trucks but yet I just do not drive. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm talking to them about numbers, all they focus in on is that I'm driving. So our perspectives are not where they need to be. And that's why a lot of clients, I mean, I get probably 10 messages a day from Facebook and I'll pick maybe one person every two weeks because I like to vet who we gonna work together to make sure we're on the same page. Mm. I got you, I got you. Where do you see, um, where do you see B Logistics as far as how, how large do you wanna grow um, your dispatch company and next level. Like how, 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 how big do you want to get? Is there a cap? Is, is sky a limit? No, nah, not really. You know, <laughs> when I look at, you know, cause you know, me, I, I love the scripture. So when the Bible talks about a man should work all the days of his life, as long as you see me, I'm be putting in some work. Right. So I can't have a destination there because when you get to that place, it's never going to be what you think it's going to be. Never. When I left my job, I was like, yo, if I come out here, and I can make $1,500 a week, oh, I'm gonna be that dude. That's what I thought. And you know, and, and now, you know, that ain't no money, right? But <laughs> right. I thought that going into it. So it's like, every time I've achieved a goal, it ain't never do what I thought it was gonna do. So now I know that, you know, having that type of goal or fixating some stuff, is not the reality. So a part of the vision for next level is hopefully by the end of next year, middle of next year, I'm gonna buy a plot of land out here, like in Seeley, Brookshire area, about 15 acres, and we are gonna have a parking garage for people on that parking garage, we're gonna do the dispatching on the spot. We pretty much gonna have everything. I'm working with another girl right now. Uh, she's a broker that dispatches the big trucks, we're working on some educational programs. So I basically wanna be a one-stop shop for truckers. I mean, I'm looking to what it looks like to be uh, like a credit union, it takes like eighty dollars to $90,000 of upfront money. So I wanna be an avenue where somebody reaches out to me for transportation and no matter what they wanna do, I can help them. From dispatching to the money, uh, you know, getting started, insurance. I want to be a beacon in this atmosphere to handle whatever it is that you need to handle. So that's what I want to do uh, for my personal company, technically, for the next level hot shot. And then, uh, as a matter of fact, even we even got a mobile car deal to tell I'm going to launch pretty soon. So even on the yard, we're going to have getting trucks clean. So it's, we're coming <laughs> for everything pretty much. If, okay. If it's the need, I'm going to address it, right? I love and then it. With the, uh, yeah, with the B Logistics, I'm trying to uh, give my game up where I can probably, when I still think about 20 clients, I'm trying to link up with my brother DeMarco and be like, yo, let's do it. I'm, I'm going to pull up 21st. I'm going to let's work this thing. I'm going to see what we can do. Let's yeah. work out some percentages. I'm trying to, I'm like, okay, 150, bet. You know what I'm saying? I'll say, I'll see you 150. That's fine. So I'm right. trying to come and do whatever I can do or whatever amount of collaborations I can get to. If we can get the 500 truck, that's what's up. You know what, right. what I mean? Because I know what I know now that's not going to help me to get to that desk, that, that, that you know, 500 truck. So I got to continue to learn. I got to be a student. I got to get around people that have paved the way 
and then just try to get as much value as I can and don't waste their time. So I got to execute. They need something from me, I'm going to do it so they know their time is not wasted with spending 10 minutes on the phone with me. So I just want to exchange that value to get there. That's amazing, man. And it's just funny how, um, you know, there's always levels to everything. No, no matter how much success you achieve, there's always another level, right? There's always somebody you can look to and say, I want to be where you're at. But then there's people below you who are saying, I want to be where you're at. You know what I mean? Correct. So, Correct. So, so, so you just now talked about where you're going. So what do you tell people who are on the way to, where, to, on the way to get to your level? What are the most important um, things they need to be thinking about um, in, in their journey when they're just getting started out and trying to get to where you are now as an entrepreneur? Okay, well, first thing I try to tell them is that your business needs to be paid first. Your business, right? Because of course, if you had a job and you know most you ever made in a week maybe was $1,000 and you come out here and start a trucking business, you made $2,000, you think that money belongs to you, but it belongs to your vision, right? So if you can pretty much live as a peasant as long as humanly possible, because why are you rewarding yourself? There's no reward. You did what you had to do. Why do you think you need to celebrate? So I try to break that mentality first because I asked them, do you want to be self-employed or do you want to run a business? We go with that first. If you want to be self-employed and create yourself a job forever, that's fine. That's your aspiration, bet. But if you want to have a business, bro, whatever your business does, you need to try to live on that 10%, 15% until you get to a place where you're trying to get to. And then scaling becomes much easier because no matter how many trucks you have, if you're still living like a peasant, you still have that scarcity mentality. And that's mm. how I try to do it. You know what I mean? I've been out here for almost four years, and I think I bought me a used Apple Watch, and I brought uh, like a laptop. That's the only two things I've purchased since I've been out here. Nothing else. I ain't got no new wardrobe. <laughs> I ain't got no car. I haven't done anything. And people are like, when you finna buy something? Never. You know what I mean? Because my goal is not to look a certain type of way. That's not my goal to look a certain type of way. I just want to pull up and people ask me what I own and I want to just drive down the street and say, all oh, this right here is me. This is mm. for my legacy. You know what I mean? I got a 10 year old son. And so I'm crafting his mentality. He done read Richest Man in Babylon. We've been going through Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I'm trying to get him to understand I'm out here for you. So when you get 16, 18 years old, you ain't never got to ask nobody for no job. You ain't got nothing because your daddy then paved the way for you. And I'm going to give you this inheritance. That's what I'm out here doing. So when he gets of age and he starts making his money, then I buy me something. Cause now I've, I've you know duplicated myself within my own you know lineage. Then I'm gonna start celebrating. But mm. so that time, so right now, that means I'm 36 now. That means I can start doing something in eight years. So from eight more years, I don't deserve to get nothing because I'm trying to make a way for him. That's when I will celebrate. So regardless of the money, it's just numbers on a piece of paper. It's numbers on a computer because I gotta make sure he good. So when I do that, then I get to celebrate. Mm. Man, that's, yeah. that's, that's powerful, man. I don't think you could have said that any better, man. Um, yeah. Man, like, it's, 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 it's been a pleasure talking to you, bro. I mean, you just, you just have, like, I, I love your mindset. I, I love where you're coming from with your business, um, you know, what, what you've built. Um, and I'm just like, uh, you, you, you blew my mind. I like it. I see your, I see your education over entertainment oh. in the background. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, that, that's, yeah. that, that's the mantra. Um, yeah. All right, man, let, let's, let's kind of start wrapping things up. Um, yeah. I want you to, you know, first just kind of give the Hustle fam, you know, that final thought, that final jewel. You've been dropping jewels all, all show. But just okay. that final thought, that final jewel. And then I want you to let everybody know where they can connect with you. Um, whether okay. it's through Next Level Hot Shots, whether it's through B Logistics, you know what I'm saying? If, if you got hot shot okay. companies out there looking to connect with, 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 with Dispatch, talk about that. Let's start with that final jewel first, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Okay, so I look at it like it's kind of traditional saying or cliche, but it's like, you know, who you surround yourself with is going to help you get to your destination, right? One thing that people do a lot of times, and I understand what they're doing, and I appreciate what they're saying, but it doesn't mean anything to me is when people that are either having a job, don't bet on themselves, haven't really accomplished anything yet, they reach out to me and say, man, I'm so proud of you, right? Because when you do that, that goes to your head sometimes. And you start doing what I like to call the captivity of comparison. When you're looking at somebody else, man, I ain't, I ain't doing what they doing, I'm doing all right, right? And yet, when I put myself around people, five or six people that are so much further along than I am, well, I can never be complacent in that. So stop listening to people that are not where you are and letting that affect you. So I'm big into that, first of all. And so I'm big into connecting, collaborations. You know, we know 
A lot of times, culturally, we get the bad thing of having that crabs in a bucket. So we need to stop all that. There's plenty out here for everybody to get some. And so somebody else needs to put you on, just be grateful, and then put somebody else on. Stop regardless of thinking you're going to make it by yourself because you're not. Because you would never got to the 10th grade without your kindergarten teacher. You would never made it to the 11th grade without your 6th grade teacher. So stop worrying about how you get there and just focus on building relationships and getting to the destination of your vision. Okay, so that would be what I would say in that regard. And so, yeah, people can find me. So I got a lot of Instagram pages or whatever because <laughs> I'm big into social media. But my personal Instagram is Brandon J underscore hustle. And so I put like all the things that I'm doing on that Instagram page because I'm showing people that from the place that you are today, the place that you're trying to go is the amount of work it's going to take. So I'm right in your face showing you I'm out working you. When you're on vacation, I'm working. When you're watching TV posting that, I'm working. So if mm. you're in my same space and you're my competition, I'm coming for you while you're playing, right? That's mm. what I'm doing on that page. That's, what, that's why I'm doing that, okay? Mm. But then mm -hmm. they want to find me and figure out about the company. That's the Instagram, Next Level High Shot. Or you can follow me on Instagram at, you know, Be Logistics and as well as Facebook. So honestly, with me having Instagram page, you can find me there. You can follow me. You can hit me up, but it's probably better to go to the Brandon J. Hustle and hit me up and we can start this conversation. And for anybody else, you know, that's listening to this, you can reach out to me, say on Brandon J. Hustle, and we can get in free 30-minute consulting for as long as I can do it. For anybody that says, hey, truck and hustle, man, get me on the phone. We can chop it up for 30 minutes when I can. And I mean, it might be 11 o'clock at night. It might be 7 p.m. So don't be tripping on whatever time we talk. But <laughs> I'm, I'm going to follow with you. If you, if you want to do some stuff, we can chop it up, man. Man, man. Yeah. Powerful, man. Listen, y'all heard that. Brandon's coming for your lunch, man. You better protect your, protect your Ooh. lunch, man. If, if you ain't got... <laughs> he, he, he wants it all. This brother's hungry. <laughs> Listen, y'all, if, if y'all don't want to connect with this brother after hearing him on this show, I, I don't know what's wrong with you, man, because you, you done laid it down, man. Laid it out. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate you joining me today. You know what I'm saying? I know you say you don't like to hear that people that, that somebody's proud of you, but I'm proud of you anyway, because I appreciate you, that. You, you're doing your thing, man. And I love to see our people, you know, striving and thriving and being positive and motivating others and just building things from the ground up, man. You you literally got it from the muscle, from the mud, and, and you represent what truck and hustle is about, man. So I appreciate you, man. And and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh man, I appreciate you, man. Shout out to everybody that's on here. I love what you're doing, brother. That's how I look at you, somebody I'm trying to get to. You know, if you foster in this environment, man, I listen to everything. So shout out to, you know, the other dude, I think on number 11, Bruce the Logistics, yeah. uh, DeMarco, everybody. I've listened to everybody pretty, everybody. I'm like, oh, they out here getting it. So I love <laughs> the whole thing that you're doing because it's for motivating sure. for me too, man. It's motivating. And, so and bro, uh, and, and what we're building here is a network, man. We're building a family. We're building a community. Um, you know, everybody who I meet through this platform, I make sure I try to connect everyone with everyone so we could all help each other with what we what we're doing in business personally. And it's just beautiful, man. Like it's 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 become more than what I ever thought it would become. And and it's a bigger it's a bigger picture than I even really knew what it would be. You know what I mean? So yeah, man. it's dope, man. And thank you for just being a part of that, man. And now you're a part of the family too, brother. So yeah, whatever, that's what's up. whatever you need, you just let me know, man, and and, and vice versa, and we're gonna keep on building, bro. For sure, man. I appreciate you, man. Salute you and, uh, you know, grace and peace to you, brother. All right, man. Take care, Hustle fam. We out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and Hustle. Let's go.